Everyday injustice. Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Tahani Abushi. She's a candidate for DA in Manhattan, and the election is less than 100 days away. Welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me, David. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for DA. No, I think it's time to do something different for Manhattan to really transform justice. And it's going to take somebody that doesn't come from the typical background, the typical experience, um, but someone that is, that is fearless in the face of power and can get things done. And that's who I am. I've dedicated my entire career as a civil rights attorney to fighting against racism, discrimination, police violence, and representing victims of sexual assault, especially children. And that's what I do. I identify abusive policies and practices and I change them. And for me, the fight for criminal justice reform is personal because when I was a kid, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. And overnight, my mother became a single parent to 10 kids. So I've seen it on both sides. I understand the impact that the decision a prosecutor makes has on our families, has on our society, and what the stability of our society depends upon. And so I'm excited to talk more about my vision, uh, what makes me different than other candidates, but really my plan to overhaul this system moving forward. So what does this race look like now that Cy Vance has uh, confirmed that he's not running? You know, my campaign was never about Cy Vance. Um, yes, he was the he is the incumbent, but you know, for me, he seemed to be just a copy and paste type district attorney. Um, and so we still had mass incarceration and criminalization. We still had serious racial disparities in the numbers. The powerful and privileged were still being given a pass. Um, and so things don't change for me. My positions stay the way they were, and we're going to push them further. But I think. Um, it's a testament to the pressure that he was under from victims and those who had were left on their own to seek justice um, and those who felt betrayed by his promises that even if he wanted to run again, um, it, it wouldn't be possible for him. Um, and what's your overall take on his legacy? I know you call them a copy and paste district attorney, uh, but what do you view him falling short on? His keeping his promises of, of change, of progressive reform, the fact that the overwhelming majority of people of color um, that came into contact with his office were sent to Rikers, the fact that we can name multiple powerful people who were let off the hook, um, uh, some of which he took campaign donations from. I think that um, people were excited at a new vision for Manhattan, but got the same old thing. Um, and he could have gone for, further. And so I think uh, he left people wanting more. He left people um, not believing things at face value, but wanting to see track records and real commitments to change. I was surprised to learn that uh, there have been just four district attorneys in the last 80 years in Manhattan. Uh, that's just a stunning number. Uh, what's interesting is uh, my father grew up near New York and he's just about 80. So in his entire life, there have been four district attorneys in New York. Um, that's just incredible. Right. Um, and, and naturally, they're all white men. Uh, so what would it mean to uh, Manhattan to have its first woman, first person of color, and first Palestinian Muslim to be able to serve as the DA? I think it would mean something transformationally different. Um, the fact that I come from the impacted communities, that I have fought to balance the scales of justice for a long time. I bring our kitchen table conversations front and center. And that's the perspective that has always been missing um, from this office. And so it, it means somebody that is, is going to bring the community in and we're going to have transparency, accountability and collaboration with the public. Um, and what do you consider the biggest issues facing Manhattan? Um, I think the top two that crossed my mind is the lack of transparency and the automation of how things are done. Um, you know, for me, what struck me most about my parents' trial was that moment in the courtroom where the judge had interrupted the proceedings and he asked the prosecutor, what are you going to do with all these kids? 
And without hesitating, she said, they're not my problem. And she kept it moving like it was business as usual. Um, and so it's important to understand that these are families. These are human beings, parents, children, loved ones that, that are impacted by our decisions and that we need to take a nuanced approach as to what's actually working. Uh, focus on rehabilitation, preventing recidivism, uh, rooting out the systemic racism. Um, and that's going to take uh, a lot of case by case analysis. And then we have to be transparent. We have to let the public know what's going on, what are what is happening with our cases and partner with our community based organizations to get it done together. But what does Manhattan look like these days? I know what Manhattan looked like when I was growing up and the kind of stereotypical picture of Manhattan. Obviously, uh, those days have changed. So what, what's it like now? And, and what are the challenges facing the community? Yeah, I think Manhattan, even now, is still ready for big change, um, especially with the pandemic has kind of um, exacerbated a lot of underlying conditions, a lot of social inequities. So we've had to have a reckoning with things that have been going on with the city um, that we may be able to look away because there were so many things going on. But with the pandemic front and center, instabilities like housing instability, economic instability, not knowing what's going on with our schools, um, people's jobs being at risk or most of them being uh, unemployed or gone for a long time now. I think that it really puts everybody um, wanting more, wanting leadership, but real leadership, not just these fancy big words, but plans. What are you going to do? How are we going to get it done? Um, and this is a moment where we can kind of start from scratch, right? We don't need to tweak, but we've moved into as efficient as possible of government. Uh, are governing, and this is the time to do it different um, from a very, very foundational perspective, and they're ready for it. So kind of a bigger picture question, you know, um, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen tragedies in uh, Boulder uh, this week and last week in Atlanta, uh, mass shootings. What do you see as the lessons for uh, those shootings and how does it apply to what you hope to do in Manhattan? Yeah, I think that's interesting. You know, um, these are such, you know, heartbreaking atrocities and tragedies that happen to loved ones. You know, simple things like going to a nail salon or massage place or going to grocery shop uh, makes us feel unsafe now. But I think uh, the gun issue really brings to light many crises that we have, right? Um, systemic racism, white supremacy, mental health, gun control. Uh, and I think we have to be serious about these conversations, um, making sure people can have ample and unrestricted access to mental health care, that we are doing better on gun control, that we are talking about white supremacy in a way that we can promote education and invest in our communities um, to ensure understanding, because we're not going to prosecute or incarcerate our way out of that hate, right? We have to come at it from a different approach, and that's what education and community resources will do. Um, and at the end of the day, we're putting the safety of the public first um, versus politicizing um, whether guns are, are good or bad, but how it's actually impacting our communities and then the way we respond in those situations. And speaking of which, uh, you know, uh, the idea of prosecuting yourself out of hate, um, how does your community respond when the shooter has a Muslim name? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for the Muslim community, we're obviously scrutinized where, uh, you know, I think it's one of the only scenarios when the faith of the shooter is a factor. Um, we saw a lot of things trending on Twitter when that happened. Um, he's Muslim, Islam, Middle Eastern. And of course, we're prepared for the uptick in Islamophobia and hate crimes. But I think for the Muslim community, and I, I don't speak on behalf of everyone, but um, we still think education is important. And we understand that this person was suffering from mental health issues. We think access to mental health services are important. We think gun control is important as well. Um, you know, public safety is something all families want to make sure that our loved ones have what they need and they will come home safely. And I want to drill down now into um, some specific issues and, you know, kind of my overarching issue is the issue of mass incarceration. 
Um, the U.S. remains the incarceration capital of the world. Uh, I was just checking the stats. Uh, the U.S. has less than 5% of the world's population, and it looks like about 20% right now of the world's incarcerated population. And I imagine that Manhattan uh, is uh, a big part of that. So uh, from your perspective, how do we reduce mass incarceration? Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And it's not really just mass incarceration for New York City. It's also the mass criminalization um, of people here. Um, I think there's two ways. One, we put out a really comprehensive decline to prosecute list. And the reason why we did it is we went according to what are things that are actually impacting public safety, how are things being used, um, and then who it's disproportionately impacting. And when you dissect that moment where law enforcement comes into contact with the civilian, uh, and you're meaningfully dissecting it uh, and criticizing it and making that data available, you're going to see that um, a lot of the charges that we have put on our list um, shouldn't be charged anyway. And for certain charges that do move forward, what is the purpose? Um, do we want rehabilitation? Do we want to prevent recidivism? We need to be addressing the root causes of these issues and making sure that we are getting people help instead of making bad situations worse and then having people come back into the communities um, unprepared. You know, over 90% of cases end in a plea. Um, I think maybe here in New York State, um, less than 15% result in jail, prison, or uh, probation with a combination of either. And then so we have to look at the overwhelming majority, the thousands of people that are processed through the criminal justice system that are saddled with fines and fees, relegating the DA's office to being debt collectors for the court and the state, and how it completely jeopardizes and undermines the stability of our homes. And so when we look at police accountability and how they're coming to, into contact with civilians, and then our scrutiny and what cases do we dismiss, what do we charge, and then what does accountability, accountability look like, um, that is how we're going to shrink the footprint of this office. Um. And, you know, Manhattan is kind of the home base for broken windows theory and stop and frisk. Um, you know, has that practice ended or is that continuing? Say that again, David. I, I, I said in terms of broken windows theory and stop and frisk, has that practice right. ended by the New York police or is it continuing? I think it's continued. Um, it's continued in, in different ways for different reasons, um, and we have to be careful with that. That's one of the reasons why we also propose scrapping what is now the Early Case Assessment Bureau and replacing it with what we'll call the Arrest Review Unit to actually scrutinize that moment where police come into contact with civilians and dissect, you know, what is the history of that officer? What are, are the specifics of the person uh, that has been stopped or that is being accused of these things? And then what is that information? and what would be the trajectory of that charge. Um, and I think it's important because whatever information that, that we synthesize from that, um, we will make it publicly available to identify abusive policies and practices and then use our office as a bully pulpit to change them. Um, and then on the back end, uh, you know, a lot of people that end up being arrested in New York end up on Rikers Island. I've heard some pretty colorful metaphors to describe uh, the conditions there, um, uh, we keep hearing that it's going to be closed or phased out. Uh, where does that stand? What are your thoughts on Rikers Island? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, um, I did criminal defense work when I first started practicing law, uh, and um, it's a horrible place. Um, it's some of the most, one of the most violent places, the most unsanitary places, uh, and it's damaging. And, you know, um, We've been endorsed, fortunately enough, by um, the family of Khalif Browder, right, who's now become a household name because he is just one of many examples of the atrocities that happen at Rikers. And also, um, this is supposed to be a temporary holding facility, and instead it criminalized people um, before anything was done with their case and really jeopardized their homes. Uh, and most people were held there because they couldn't afford to pay the small amount of bail. So there was money put on the presumption of innocence. For those who can pay, their lives can remain stable as they resolve their issue. For those who could not pay, they had to serve time. 
Um, and so I think that um, we definitely need to work on actually closing Rikers. The numbers have started to go up again. Um, and there's a normalcy with keeping it open and delaying it, a conversation that um, those, those who have the authority to close it have been a little too comfortable um, being, you know, using as an excuse. So I think we need to keep an eye on that ball and make sure we shut it. And, and just to explain to people who might not be as familiar, uh, what is the Khalif Browder story? Khalif Browder was a, a young man that was accused of stealing a backpack. And so um, he was arrested and detained in Rikers. And he languished there for over three years, two of which he was held in solitary confinement. Um, and uh, his case is a piece about bail, but also about technical parole violations, because on another case, he had been put on parole. And so this second accusation had triggered a violation. So at first he couldn't afford the bail. Then when he had the, the chance to scrape up whatever he could, they wouldn't even let him post bail because of that underlying technical parole violation. So he languished for three years there until the district attorney's office finally admitted they didn't have the evidence to move forward with his case anyway, and it was dropped. But once he was finally released, he had just suffered so much abuse from correction officers and other people who were incarcerated with him um, that he suffered a lot of mental and emotional damage and unfortunately took his life a year later. It's just an incredibly tragic story because it was such a minor offense to begin with. He ends right. up staying as long as he did. And and if the story ended there, it would be bad. But, you know, he got brutalized in there. He was in solitary and he ends up uh, committing suicide. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And he was young, really young, right? Right. 16 when he was arrested on that. Uh, just unbelievable. Um, and then, um, so talk a bit about, um, you, you mentioned it in, in some of your campaign uh, material, uh, the criminalization of people of color and what you kind of hope to do about that. Stop it, uh, as simple as possible. Um, you know, it's, it's not by mistake that people of color, specifically our black and Latino communities, make up majority of the arrests, prosecutions, and incarcerations in this city. And that's why it's very important to scrutinize that moment where police come into contact with our communities. Are they going into Harlem, Washington Heights, Inwood, and the Lower East Side to fill their quotas? Um, these cases that are being resolved with fines and fees, even if they're reduced to violations, they are still not only burdensome on these families, but they impact the obstacles and opportunities that lie ahead for them because of this one interaction. Um, and so we plan to put a lot of resources into that first step. Um, and really ensuring that we are holding police accountable, we are making systemic and structural change, but also we are including the impacted community in our decision-making process. Not consulting, stopping by and keep moving, but hiring people who are not only formally incarcerated, but that also come from the communities, our community leaders, being in partnership with our community-based organizations, and ensuring that we're responding from a thorough public health and comprehensive approach to addressing the issues that are going on, especially systemic racism. Um, but won't people uh, come back and, and say, well, aren't people of color the ones who are committing the crimes in the first place? So naturally you're going to have a disproportionate number uh, end up in the system? Um, you know, that that premise is just offensive and racist, honestly. Um, I don't even think that's that's a point to really respond to. Um, there's no one that is born prone to a life of criminal conduct. Um, everyone across the board who faces these instabilities are targets, but also um, law enforcement is the one making that decision. So I think there's a lot to scrutinize there, but um, that argument, that premise is just, um, nonsense. So how do we reduce the racial disparities? I don't know what the numbers are like in, in Manhattan, but I know uh, out in California, um, there are counties where, uh, like San Francisco, for example, 55% uh, of the people in San Francisco jail right now are Black, even though the population of San Francisco is only 6% Black. So you have this tremendous uh, inequality, I assume it's probably similar in New York as well. 
How do you address those? Well, look, we can't underestimate the fact that our law enforcement, uh, especially um, police, right, stem from a history of being slave catchers. Um, and that this nation's egregious and dark history of slavery and the oppression of people, even our Native American indigenous brothers and sisters, right? And so we might have called it a different name. We might have established bureaus. We do implicit bias training, but we're still coming from a very dark history of racism. And it plays out in many different ways, one of which is these racial disparities, right? The comfort of going into a community that is predominantly Black and Latino, um, showing police presence, uh, doing large gang takedowns, um, showing uh, police force and, and having high incarceration and prosecution rates is, is, has been normalized. But, you know, David, when you look at the safest neighborhoods in Manhattan or even this entire country, you won't see police presence. You won't see a plan to be, build five jails on every borough, right? You won't see metal detectors in the high schools. You're going to see a lot of resources, high uh, employment rates, home ownership rates, access to mental health facilities, um, substance use disorder facilities and treatment centers, um, a real investment in people instead of taking advantage and criminalizing the struggles, which is what happens in our predominantly Black and Latino communities. And so what kinds of resources can you bring to bear as a district attorney that uh, are absent right now? I think the perspective of the other constituents of Manhattan, of our communities of color, of those who have been impacted by this office, um, I've seen it firsthand um, and during my father's incarceration um, and how the prosecutor and the prosecution system worked in that way and then fighting against it for 11 years. Um, the cases that we've handled um, are very uh, complex cases, right? They are involved police violence. And so whether it means getting officers disciplined, terminated or criminally charged, that means we'll put no badge or bank account above the law, going against Trump when he dropped his Muslim ban ensuring that every last person was released from the airport uh, and fought him all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, making sure that our communities are protected instead of criminalized for their way of life and ensuring that there's equal resources um, instead of worrying about um, who has a bigger bank account or what is the color of their skin, understand that these are all our families and we are responsible for every single one of them. Across the country, we've seen a lot of pushback against progressive reform uh, district attorneys. Um, and it's really been a huge number. Um, so Krasner's had issues in, in, in Philadelphia, um, out here in California, George Gascon uh, is facing potential recall, uh, strong opposition from his uh, uh, deputy uh, district attorneys, uh, Chesa Bodine up in San Francisco, uh, likewise, in uh, Missouri, Kim Gardner um, has uh, had the legislature and uh, the attorney general attempting to strip powers from her. Uh, I, uh, Aramis uh, Ayala in Florida ended up not running for re-election because she was stripped of the power uh, of whether or not to charge a case uh, as a death penalty case. Um, so. Are you anticipating if you got elected that there would be pushback? Um, do you think that there would be resistance within the ranks? Uh, what, what are you hearing? Yeah, I'm sure there will be. I'm expecting it. That's what change is about, is, is about something different. And I think we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, I've navigated these kinds of adversarial waters as a civil rights attorney for a long time. Um, and we've still changed policies within the NYPD, within our fire department, um, really tackled big complex issues within agencies as big as the Department of Education. Um, and we get people to the table and if they are willing to change their mind, we make things happen. And if not, look, there will be termination. There will be um, people who are leaving. They're probably leaving now in anticipation of, of um, a new administration coming in, but we shouldn't be afraid of that, right? If, if, I, if a progressive prosecutor or someone who calls themselves a progressive prosecutor won and it was a seamless trans uh, transition and we felt no difference, that would be a big problem. But what comes out of rocking the boat are these real conversations 
Um, and we have to understand also that criminal justice reform um, has passed with overwhelming majority on the ballots across the country. Uh, we're having conversations that we haven't had in a very long time in a meaningful way. And the fact that, that these non-traditional prosecutors were even elected is a big sign that society is ready for something different. And let's also acknowledge that even though the narrative is being pushed that crime is rising, I mean, let's, let's focus on New York City. We have five district attorney's offices here in New York City, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Attorney General's Office, the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, and an NYPD with over 35,000 members and an $11 billion budget. So with all of these resources, staffs, and, and offices, right, in just this five-borough location, right, but crime, we're being told, is still rising. Something's clearly not working. Right? And we have some of the harshest sentencing laws, and we have Rikers, and we have plenty of jails and prisons, but we're saying it's not working. And so we have to do something different. We have to do something that works, and it's going to be harder. And that is actually addressing the root causes of these issues with resources so that we're focusing on rehabilitation and preventative measures. So, I, you know, that all sounds good. I guess my question is, as a district attorney, do you have the ability to really get to those root causes or are you going to need broader buy-in from, uh, you know, the city and the state in order to do more? Of course, it's going to take a lot of work. You're talking about relationships, uh, speaking with people, uh, making sure that we have a, a broad and diverse coalition of people who are working with us to further our vision. And that is where our activists and our community-based organizations um, and different sectors come into play, right? Because these families don't just come into contact with our office and then that's it. They are in, they go to school, they have jobs, they need social services, they are in our communities, they are their neighbors. So any decision that's made has to be one that is comprehensive and it impacts all of them. Um, and so I think that's, it's, is it gonna take time? Sure, is it gonna take work? Of course it's gonna take work. We have a lot of work to do here, but we have to start with changing those minds and, and being unequivocal in our positions to get these things done. So I want to talk about policing a little bit. Uh, last year, of course, uh, the Eric, or uh, not the Eric Garner, uh, that was that was five years ago. But uh, last year it was George Floyd, um, which triggered uh, all sorts of protests across the country. Um, some recent reports have come out uh, that really scrutinized uh, policing, especially in, in New York which of course I find ironic that uh, here you have protests about the treatment of people of color by police and then the police abuse the people of color who are protesting. Uh, so what's your take on uh, the police response to the protests? And, and as a district attorney, uh, what can you do about it? I think that uh, the police uh, were indiscriminately assaulting protesters. Um, and really took advantage of things like a curfew, um, the fact that we were in a pandemic, the fact that um, they were tasked with such authority and control, um, and they really hurt people. I witnessed it as a legal observer myself and being part of these protests, um, and uh, I support the attorney general's lawsuit to hold them accountable. I thought it was just egregious, the behavior and the brutality that we saw. And yes, the district attorney's office can do something about it. I currently represent a protester um, that was pushed to the ground violently by an officer, and he is now facing criminal charges with the Brooklyn district attorney's office. Um, I think there's, there's uh, a lot of protections for police officers, um, but for behavior like this that is just blatantly violent, uh, it has to be called out. Otherwise, it, it seems to be a pattern in practice that is acceptable. Do you feel like the current laws make it too difficult to charge police officers for on-duty conduct? I don't think it makes it too difficult. I think you need to have a district attorney that's willing to make that decision. Um, there is a lot of uh, protections on the civil side. Um, on the criminal side, you know, the district attorney's office just has a lot more information than is available to the public. 
Um, and with the grand jury proceedings being secret, there's just a lot of things that happen and the public is in the dark until we hear the final results. Um, but I think that a lot of it comes from the tolerance of the district attorney's office is what conduct um, qualifies to move forward and what doesn't. And I mentioned Eric Garner a few minutes ago. Um, can you talk about you know that case and if such a case arose uh, with your office, how you would try to handle it? Yeah, I think um, it would be important to, at a minimum, release the grand jury minutes to the public um, to to show transparency. You know. Um, the grand jury minutes were released in the Breonna Taylor case, and then our attorney general here um, released them for the Daniel Prude case um, that happened in Rochester. And I think that gives people um, insight right, into exactly what is going on and how these decisions are being made. Um, and I think there should have been accountability, not six years later, not in lawsuits that just are going to give information that is too late to do anything with. Um, but as it was happening, that was a moment where, where the whole world saw this on video and knew it was unnecessary and excessive um, and nothing was done about it. And I think in these particular moments, um, it's, it's a chance for the DA's office to do the right thing uh, and to allow the public to be involved through the prosecution process, right, um, to ensure accountability. And why do you think the ball was dropped on this? There's so many reasons. I mean, um, there's a fear of holding officers accountable. Um, people might say it and it sounds great, but when it comes time to do it, I think um, those who have never done it before buckle under pressure and maybe pass it along for, for someone else to do something about. Um, I think there is a concern that it is Staten Island, um, right? Um, and, and Eric Garner's a black man and the officer was white. So I think that definitely plays a role in it. And we're talking about police violence against black people. That is a conversation that can be uncomfortable for some, but I think it's absolutely necessary when you talk about police accountability um, and what happens next. And what about the safety of our black community uh, and our Latino community? And I think uh, all of those points are, are important, but also why we need somebody that is not afraid to talk about those issues and do something about it when issues like that come up. And, you know, this was, again, another case where the incident that he was alleged to have done is so minor. You're just like, why are these minor offenses escalating to the point where deadly force ends up being used? Right, right. Um, it, it's just, uh, you know, we see it time and time again. You know, it's not even necessarily the most serious cases that end up uh, you know, drawing all the attention. Yeah, um, but they allow us to, to have these serious conversations, but but not not in a way that just passes time, but to do something about it. Um, and, and so kind of moving on, um, what is the state of bail reform? And if you're elected, what are you going to do about bail, uh, assuming that uh, things are still up in the air at that point? I think, look, the district attorney has a lot of discretion. And so, um, you know, we might take guidance from what's happening in the legislature, but I think it's also an opportunity to um, drive in a different change. And so I'm for ending cash bail uh, and we'll institute that policy under my administration. And I think it's important to have open file discovery. Um, and we'll ensure that the defense has access to um, the information that we have so people can make an informed decision. We can be held accountable um, and that we aren't coercing people into pleas because it makes prosecuting and convicting easy. Um, and to, to really respect and protect the constitutional rights, especially as they apply in a criminal proceeding. And then finally, uh, on wrongful convictions, uh, what are you planning to do? Look, you know, um, a lot of wrongful convictions might be on faulty witness statements or bad policing, but it involves a good amount of prosecutorial misconduct. And I think the important thing here is to uh, avoid them. And that means from the moment that case comes forward into our office to scrutinize it um, as much as possible to ensure this is a case that absolutely has to move forward. And as it's moving forward, that we are transparent and ethical uh, in every step um, to avoid the wrongful convictions. 
Um, and for those that exist, I think we actually have to use the conviction integrity unit that now exists with the Manhattan DA's office. Um, hire civil rights attorneys, public defenders, uh, appellate attorneys, those whose mind uh, aren't a one track former prosecutor track, but actually has the eye towards understanding accountability and what is appropriate and not, and making sure that that process happens fast um, so that those cases that need to be uh, vacated are done. All right. And uh, so finally, um, why don't uh, we're just about out of time. So kind of give us some of your closing thoughts and uh, what you're looking forward to in the next 100 days. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a win. I think this is just such an, a historic opportunity for Manhattan and for um, New York to elect a, a district attorney that has walked in the shoes of those impacted by this office. Um, somebody that has been fearless in the face of power that will collaborate and be transparent with the public. Um, we really have an opportunity to focus on how we're going to make the society stable for everyone. Ensure that there's one system of justice that we put no badge or bank account above the law. Um, and we got a couple of a month and change left or two months and change left to the race. Uh, and I think this is probably one of the most important races going down in New York City. Great. Well, I want to thank you for coming on our show and talking about your candidacy and a little bit about uh, Manhattan and the district attorney's office. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, David. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system.